Good morning, Grace Fellowship. Thank you once again for joining us online. Uh, we really appreciate uh, the fact that you do join us online. And uh, we're really hopeful for the near future that we'll be able to see each other face to face again. Um, that is something that's so precious to me and uh, it's something we're not able to do now. And it's unfortunate, but it's necessary at this time. And so um, thank you for joining us in this way digitally. Uh, it's getting to that time of the year where we are getting close to Christmas and we start thinking about Christmas and all the things that Christmas entails. And uh, we get to be reminded of the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so um, today we're going to be going through uh, one of the last prophecies before Jesus Christ was born. And we find that in Luke chapter 1 and Clay's going to be taking us through that today. And next week we're going to be going through the Christmas story in Luke chapter 2. So I'm pretty excited about that and we hope you join us next week for that as well. And uh, yeah, because this Christmas is, it's really such a different Christmas and it's actually probably more like the original Christmas, you could say, the year that Jesus was born um, than any other Christmas in my lifetime anyway. Uh, Mary and Joseph were away from their family and friends and they were in a place that wasn't their home and uh, they were in a place that was not comfortable um, in a barn and Mary was pregnant and they were there all because the government made them be there to be registered so they could be taxed. This was a government mandate that they had to travel to this place of Joseph's heritage so that they could be taxed and, and they were away from family and friends and that's when our Savior, Jesus Christ, was born. And so this Christmas a lot of us are going to be missing family and friends too because we're not going to be able to gather like we normally have been and um, things are going to be a little bit more strange. It's going to be, there's more restrictions put on us by the government, government mandated things. And so I just want to encourage each one of you to, um, to really take this Christmas and make it one of the uh, best Christmases ever in the sense that it really points you back to Jesus Christ. And um, we want to remember that Jesus, he was born and it's wonderful and it, it's a celebration, but he was born so that he could die for our sin and that we could have life with him. So it's a celebration for us, but there's, um, it's a very sobering thing as well that the God of the universe would have to leave his home in heaven to come save his people because we were so sinful and incapable of saving us ourselves. And so let's be reminded of that this Christmas. All right, so before Clay gets into the sermon, we've been going through something called a catechism over the last little while, or I should say over the last year. And there's 52 questions and answers. And uh, this catechism you can find at newcitycatechism.com. It's these short little truths that are gleaned from scripture that just remind us of who Jesus is and, and the purpose of, of the life of Jesus. And, uh, and it just reminds us of these truths from scripture and they're helpful. They're, they're kind of distilled down into little question and answer forms that are helpful. We can memorize them and be reminded of them often. And so what's going to happen is we're going to have the question um, and the answer displayed on the screen. And I'm going to read the question and then I'm going to read the answer. And you guys can read the answer along with me in your houses or wherever you are at this, at this moment. And uh, it might seem a little awkward to read along with me, but I'm going to try and read it. the answer slow enough that you guys can read it along with me. Um, it's one of the ways that we can kind of feel like we're doing this all together. So, all right, here's the Here's the question, and this is question number 49. We're almost at the end of the year. Where is Christ now? And all right, so the answer is going to pop up on the screen. You can read this along with me. Christ rose bodily from the grave on the third day after his death and is seated at the right hand of the Father, ruling his kingdom and interceding for us until he returns to judge and renew the whole world is so applicable for today and for this season. Jesus is coming back. He came the first time as a baby and he is going to come back and we will see Jesus face to face and we will understand what it means to be a part of his kingdom to the fullest. All right, let's just pray before Clay takes us through Luke chapter one. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for who you are. We thank you that you sent your son to save us from our sin, to do the very thing that we could never do, the one thing we could absolutely never do in, save, in saving ourselves. And so we thank you for that. And I just pray that as we go through the scripture this morning, reminding ourselves of your first coming, I pray that we don't just look back to your first coming. I mean, that's super important and, and 
it gives us great hope, but we also look forward to the future coming, your second coming, Lord, that we would just understand how great that is and we can, we can look forward to that, that day coming. That is a promise that you have given us and we can look forward to that and hang on to that. Just as you promised you would come the first time, you are coming again. And we thank you for that. And I just pray that you would give us wisdom and knowledge as we go through this passage of Scripture, that this passage of Scripture would really just build our love and our worship for you this morning and our faith in you. And it would encourage us to keep on, even though the, these times have been trying times, Lord. I just pray that it would be that type of encouragement that would just encourage us to keep on in the faith, always realizing that you are in control, you are all-powerful, you are almighty, and you have a purpose in all of this, just as you had a purpose in the lives of Mary and Joseph, even though it was very difficult circumstances for them. I just pray this in your name. Amen. All right, Clay's going to take us through the last part of Luke chapter 1. Good morning, Grace. Thank you for joining us again to hear from God's Word together. My name is Clay. I'm one of the pastors here along with Mark, who just gave the intro. We're taking a break for a couple of weeks here from our series in the book of James to focus in on Advent. If that word Advent is new to you, Advent is the time of the year that leads up to Christmas. The word literally means to anticipate the arrival of a notable person or event. Now, as Christmas is quickly approaching, we want to take pause to reflect on what it means to wait for and anticipate the arrival of Jesus' second coming by reflecting on his first coming. So this morning, we're going to be looking at one of the last prophecies made about Jesus before his birth. And this is recorded at the very end of the first chapter in the book of Luke. So if you would please grab your Bible, turn with me to the Gospel of Luke. It's the third book in the New Testament scriptures. So you'll find it roughly in the last 20% of your Bible. See where I have it there? So in Luke chapter 1, where we will be looking at today, it's often referred to as Zechariah's song or Zechariah's prophecy. We'll be starting around verse 67, and we're going to listen to the scripture reading together. But before we do that, while you're turning there, let's pray and set our hearts right to hear from God's word. And I, and I would invite you to actually take out your Bible and read along. I think it'll be good and helpful. So, Father... Thank you so much that you allow us to open up your word. Thank you that you've given us the scriptures to see who you are and all that you've done for us. Jesus, we thank you that you've revealed yourself to us through the scriptures so that we can see that everything from beginning to end points us to who you are and all that you've done. Thank you for this good news of the gospel. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, let's listen to the scripture as it's being read, and then we'll walk through it together. And his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people, and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke from the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days and you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways. To give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins. Because the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high. To give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet in the way of peace. And the child grew, grew became strong in spirit. And he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. Merry, Merry Christmas, Christmas, everybody! Merry Christmas, filthy animals.
Now, before we dig right into this passage and what it's all about, let's look at the wider context of the story that we find ourselves in. Now, verse 67 tells us, and his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. So verse 67 tells us that Zechariah was the father to someone. Well, if you read back a few verses, we'll see that he's the father of a baby named John. Now, this is John the baptizer. But I want us to go back a little further yet. Before John, before Zechariah, now let's go back to the very beginning. In the very beginning of the Bible, yeah, we're going to go that far, that beginning. The book of Genesis. In the book of Genesis, which the word literally means beginnings, the first four words are, in the beginning, God. That means that before there was anything created, before anything that we can taste and see and touch was made, there was God. There was this eternal being who existed outside of what we know as creation. This is God. And we, when we read through the scriptures, we get to know this God. And we are told that he is holy, meaning he is separate and high above everything created. He's perfect, he's complete, and he needs nothing. He's all-knowing, all-seeing, and all-present. Everything he does is good. And we're told that he exists in a nature of perfect love and harmony in three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We call this the Trinity. And this Trinity, out of love and joy, decides to create. So God creates the universe and everything in it. He speaks and it appears. He creates time and space, planets and galaxies. He creates the large and the small. He creates heavenly realm and a physical realm with creatures fit for each. And then, out of all that he created, he forms this little planet, the one that we find ourselves on, and he makes it liv livable for all kinds of different creatures, wild beasts, reptiles, birds, you name it. He creates them all to demonstrate his goodness, his creativity, and his glory. And then, right before taking time to rest and look upon all that he had made, as a jewel of his creative power, he gets down in the dirt, in the elements of his creation. And with his own hands, he forms something in his image. He creates mankind. That's us. Male and female, he creates our first parents, Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were made to walk alongside God in creation. They were, they were made for joy and productivity. And so God puts them in a garden. He fills it with abundance and order. And, and now he gives Adam and Eve the job to enjoy God, enjoy each other, and enjoy his creation. And they're to continue on in the creative process with him, filling the earth with more people and making the rest of the world look like the garden that he placed them in. This is amazing. Now in all that, God gave them one rule. He told them to trust him. And as a picture of that rule, he, pit, he put one tree, a certain tree, in the middle of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he told them that they could eat the fruit of any tree in the garden except for that one, because if they ate of that tree, they would die. It wasn't just a test to see if they could avoid the fruit of that tree, but a test of their love for him and a test of their belief in his love for them a test to see if they believed that God was good, that he was trustworthy, that he really did have their best at heart. When we get to the third chapter of the book of Genesis, we're introduced to a talking snake. And I mean, that probably seems weird to us, but maybe to Adam and Eve, they just thought, so I guess talking snakes are a thing now, eh? I mean, everything else had just been made, it's new, who knows? So the snake starts talking. Later, we actually find out that the snake is Satan. He's a fallen angel. Now, if you don't know anything about angels, angels were some of God's heavenly creatures. They were made with the job to help God's people. But Satan, having rebelled against God, he hated God. And he hated all that God made. So he did his best to, to convince Adam and Eve that God wasn't actually trustworthy. That he didn't have their best in mind. And that 
we couldn't be sure about his love. So the snake tells them that God is holding out on them. He lies to them about the consequences of the fruit of the tree. And he makes them doubt what God really said. It's just like the, we have the same tendency, right? The snake convinces them that they could be better gods than God himself. We believe the same thing all the time. And rather than believe the promises of God, rather than trust in his goodness, his faithfulness, and his character, they believe the lying serpent and they eat of the tree that they were commanded not to eat from. This is crazy. Through their actions, sin entered the world and caused a great deal of pain for them and all creation hereafter. Not only had they severed the relationship with God, but it would now lead to separation and brokenness in all of our earthly relationships too. The world is broken. And now there, there's no way for mankind to fix it. But once they knew they had sinned, Adam and Eve, what they did was they hid in shame because they were unable to make things right with God by themselves. And although God did not take away the consequences of their actions, God showed his mercy. Because while he was telling them the curse that was now upon them, he also made for them a promise. He told them that there would one day be a deliverer to come to rescue them out of the bondage to sin that they had willfully entered into. Through one born of a woman, there would be a savior who would take the curse upon himself, crush the head of the serpent, and through his own pain and suffering, he would bring full restoration between God and man. But as we continue to move forward in this book of history, we see mankind slip deeper and deeper into sin. So God chooses for himself a people, from a man named Abraham, to be a testimony to the rest of the world that God is good, God is faithful, and God is a redeeming God. So he gives them rules to follow and systems to set up. From the priesthood to the sacrificial system, all of it would point to the coming rescuer who would be known as the Messiah. And from within this people who become known as the nation of Israel, God chooses for himself messengers known as prophets to be the mouthpiece to remind them of the coming rescuer, the chosen one, the Messiah, who would finally, ultimately, deliver them from the sin that they would continue to run back to over and over again. God has to send prophet after prophet, reminding them to turn away from trusting themselves and to trust in God because his promises, his promises are good and they should believe his promises, believe his goodness, believe that he makes a better God than we do. We're still given this. Now, most of the time, the Israelites, they don't listen. And even when they do, it's short-lived. And the nation goes back to ignoring God. And the cycle continues again and again. Prophets come, they preach the word of God. People may or may not listen. And it keeps going over and over again until it doesn't anymore. And the messages stop coming. The prophecies stop. And then there's 400 years of silence from God. Until an angel shows up to a priest of God's people, an old man with no children. His name is Zechariah. And he tells, this angel tells him that in his old age, God will allow he and his wife Elizabeth to have a son. And they're supposed to call him John. He's told that John will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb, that he would be a prophet of the Most High God, tasked with preparing for the arrival of the Messiah. The promised rescuer was coming, and Zechariah was just told that his son was going to be the last prophet to pave the way for the Messiah. How amazing is that? Who gets to be the prophet to pave the way for the Messiah? And like you and I would probably have a hard time believing this, Zechariah has a hard time believing the angel. So to prove it to him, the angel makes Zechariah mute 
until the birth of his son. He can't speak at all. And lo and behold, mute and all, Elizabeth, who is well advanced in years at this point too, miraculously gets pregnant. And just as the angel had said, Zachariah is unable to speak during the entire pregnancy. So nine months passed by. With Zechariah living in this tension of feeling isolated from his inability to speak, but also he's anticipating the birth of his own son as well as the coming Messiah when finally his son is born. And as was the custom, eight days after the birth of his son, they take John to be circumcised and they give him his name. Now, there is some confusion as to what his name is supposed to be. Because in those days, you always made sure to give your firstborn son a name that ran in the family. But finally, as an act of faith and joy, Zechariah, he's actually able to speak. And he reminds everyone that the name of his son is to be John, which means God has been gracious. And with that, his tongue was loosed and he's able to speak again. And the first thing he does is he praises God and God fills him with the Holy Spirit and he begins to prophesy, to bring forth a message from God. And that's where we finally get to our passage today, where Zechariah says this, starting in verse 68. He says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. He praises God because of the coming Savior who is coming to finally rescue them. Now, when most people would have heard Zechariah, they would have thought that he was talking about the Roman government who had taken control over almost the entire known world at the time. They had been oppressed and they had been given tight rules and regulations for what they could and couldn't do as people. And many were hoping that when the Messiah would come, he would topple the government and finally bring a perfect utopia where they could be free to do whatever they wanted to not having to worry about the government getting its hands into areas it has no business being in. If the Messiah was from the lineage of David, they thought, the greatest king to have ever ruled over Israel. And since the horn used in this context is speaking of an offensive weapon, as opposed to a musical horn announcing victory, if the horn of salvation if it's this weapon and it's coming to save us from the hand of all who hate us, then surely this means the Messiah would lead them in a great battle and take back their land for God and for his people. Surely that's what it must mean, right? But let's keep reading. Verses 72 to 75. To show the mercy promised to our fathers, and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. So we get to see here that the Messiah was coming to show mercy and to remember his holy covenant. This is where we need to remember that God's covenant was that the nation of Israel would be a blessing to the nations. That they would demonstrate who God was to show his steadfast love, mercy, and grace. The plan from the beginning was not that the Messiah would come to create a political kingdom, but rather a much more comprehensive kingdom that encompasses all of life both now and well into eternity. And this victory would allow us to be delivered, not just from physical enemies, but of our deepest enemies of sin, death, 
and hell. And what are we delivered to? It says to serve God without fear, in holiness and in righteousness. Then in verse 76, Zechariah starts speaking of his newborn son. So let's read 76 to 79. And you, child, will be called prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Zechariah's son, John, John the Baptist, he would be called prophet of the Most High. He would get to go before the Messiah to prepare them to hear this amazing news of salvation. And what is this news of salvation? We're told, once again, it's not a political victory, but it's forgiveness of sins. This isn't about us being given political freedom to just do what we want and to have our government be the system and style that we want. This is about us not having to worry about sin ruling and reigning over us anymore. That's way better than having even the best government. Because what good is a good government system if we're all still enslaved to sin? You see, Every time the nation of Israel decided to go their own way, trusting in themselves rather than God, whether their system was good or not, they demonstrated that they were ruled by sin. And so, to point that out to them, God allowed them to be conquered by enemy nations so that they would realize that they had been following their own wicked hearts rather than following God. But the real enemy wasn't It wasn't just that nation or those rulers or the government. The real enemy has always been the sin that's in our hearts. It's the sin that keeps us from loving God and worshiping God. And so that is the enemy that God was promising to get rid of. See, we deserve to be devoured by this enemy because we keep running back to him, begging to be enslaved. But we were rescued by God, because God is merciful. Like it says here, we live in a world that is filled with deep darkness. It very much is the shadow of death. Now, most of us, we know that the world is broken, but we can often have a hard time admitting that the brokenness of our world comes from the darkness in our own hearts. I mean, we often think that it's something out there rather than in here. It's so common to hear people talk about how humanity is basically good. How we're all mostly good people, right? I mean, we don't, we don't do that much bad, do we? But we don't realize that humanity is living in the dark. Yes, there is a lot of good that happens in the world. We're not as bad as we could be all the time. But deep down, if we actually think about the intentions of our hearts, we realize that apart from the grace of God working in our hearts, we're all about ourselves. Almost every opportunity we get, we're doing the same thing that Adam and Eve did. We're looking out for our own best interests without even thinking that God is part of the equation at all. Or if he is, he's holding something back from us. But the Messiah... He was coming to shine light in the darkness, to guide our feet in the way of peace. The peace with God that had been broken in the garden all those years before. This peace could finally be mended. The Messiah would make a way. Now, we're going to get more into this next week, but if you didn't figure it out yet, the Messiah was Jesus. And the good news is that Jesus really did come to fulfill the promises that the prophets had spoken about, including John's father, Zechariah, 
as well as everything that John himself would speak about as well. Jesus really did come to crush the head of the serpent. And he did it through pain and suffering. Jesus came to shine the light in the darkness. But in shining that light, he also had to absorb the darkness himself. He was able to forgive sin, but he forgave it by absorbing and becoming our sin for us. And he brought us salvation by taking the punishment and the curse that we deserved by our rebellion to God. And he could only do that because not only was he sent by the Most High, Jesus was the Most High God, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity who created the universe and everything in it. He himself came to be amongst his people, giving up his own life as a sacrifice to deliver us from our enemies of sin, death, and hell forever. And because he was the perfect sacrifice, with no sin to hold him down, he defeated death and he rose back to life so that those who follow him in death will follow him into eternal life as well. And John, John would get to be the one to tell everyone to make way for the coming Messiah. Let's read verse 80. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. Though Jesus the Messiah would be born not long after John, before going public, with this amazing news. John still had to wait. He had to grow in spirit, grow in patience, grow in endurance. He had to walk through the difficulty of the wilderness while he awaited his Messiah and his own deliverance. And now for us, in many ways, we have to wait just like John did. Yeah, Jesus did come to earth and he lived a perfect life. He died the death we should have died and he rose again. And he's also promised that he's coming back again. That's because his rescue plan isn't quite finished yet. The world is still broken. We're still a mess. Yet we're a saved mess, but a mess nonetheless. Dr. Seuss, right? He didn't say that, but why not? The world is not yet the way it's supposed to be, right? But for us, we trust with patience that our day is coming. But he has promised that while we wait, there is still work to be done. It's not the work of salvation because Jesus did that for us on the cross. But now we do the work that John did, reminding people of this great salvation that's been completed for us. And we do it all while we await Jesus' return. And so we invite others to see the light of the world, the Lamb of God who takes away their sin. And this is the amazing part about Christmas. It gives us the opportunity to remember once again that Jesus really did come into the world. He fulfilled so many promises, which can now give us assurance that he will fulfill the rest. So what this means is that Christmas really isn't just a time to gather with family and to think that we already have everything we need. Christmas is a chance to remember that the life to come is worth longing for. So no, no matter what happens this year with who you can or can't get together with, nobody can stop Christmas from coming. Nobody's canceling Christmas. In fact, maybe this year, we can actually have the best Christmas ever. Because rather than focusing on who is or isn't coming over, how many different parties we have to go to, or which extended family gets us on Christmas Day, instead of all those things we typically worry about, we can focus on praising Jesus for his first coming while begging him to come again. So this year, maybe unlike many other years before, maybe that we will actually get to experience the kind of Christmas that allows us to truly anticipate the Messiah. 
Father, I thank you that we have this this time and this season to remember Jesus. Thank you that you have given us ways that we can think of and ponder and be amazed by the beauty of Jesus, you coming down to be with, with us, to find us, to rescue us. And Jesus, I thank you that even though you rose again and we can't see you physically, I thank you that you're in us through your spirit. And I thank you that you are coming again, that we will one day see you face to face. And I pray that in this time of waiting that we are experiencing right now, that you would truly allow us to long for you, long for that day when we get to see you and be with you, behold your beauty and your majesty in a way that we can't even comprehend right now. Thank you for this amazing good news. I pray that we would truly enjoy you, enjoy one another, and enjoy all that you've given us this Christmas. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.